Hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Um, and uh, Aaron, if you could unshare for a sec. Excellent. So uh, I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we're an advocacy organization uh, working for a, a national rail program to build high speed regional and interregional passenger trains. Uh, linking cities, towns, and regions across the whole country together. Um, we help people understand what high speed and regional rail is, uh, why we need to build it, and what steps can be taken to make it a reality. Um, if you like this program, if you want to share that basic concept with your friends, uh, you can share it with a hat. Um, and so if you go to hsrail.org and up in the upper left right hand corner hit get merch um, you can gab your own hat as well or a t-shirt which would be just as cool so uh, really excited about today's program you know we've got new planning efforts around the uh, uh, country going on uh, both with a program called corridor id and with a long distance network proposal from the fra um, one of the key lessons from uh, the most recent round of federal funding for projects was uh, states need to get their project ready to go. And the corridor ID program is designed to do that. So um, I will switch over to Chris, our deputy director, who will talk about our uh, speaker and how that relates. Thanks, Rick, and thanks everyone for being here today. And uh, this is exciting because we've been talking uh, with our speaker, Aaron Rosiello, uh, to about putting this together for a few months now. And so the day is finally here. Uh, Aaron Rosiello has, uh, has a career built on experience networking, cultivating relationships by connecting people, building coalitions, and forging collaborative partnerships in various roles throughout her career, both in the private sector and for government agencies. Uh, this includes sales and marketing in the private sector and working for the state as part of the strategic development team for Ohio's Bureau of Workers Comp, or BWC, as one of four regional liaisons to the administrator. Uh, as a regional manager for the BWC, Aaron was responsible for cultivating relationships, educating and problem solving, working with business owners uh, and government and elected officials in 14 counties. Prior to uh, joining All Aboard Ohio, Aaron owned and operated an auto repair shop in Milford, Ohio, gaining experience as a business owner and entrepreneur. Aaron has also had multiple roles with All Aboard Ohio, including as its secretary, vice chair, and until just a few weeks ago as All Aboard Ohio's chair. Uh, so with that, uh, please, if you have questions, please put them in Zoom's Q&A feature or use that feature or put comments in the chat. And let's turn things over to Erin Rosiello. Thank you so much. Let me get this uh, up for everybody to see. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to learn a little bit more about passenger rail advocacy and a successful campaign that we had here in Ohio. I wanted to take a quick minute to thank Rick and Chris and Dylan Hayward for making it possible for me to join you today. And Aaron, your uh, your presenter's notes are are showing this time. Oh, goody. Um, well, we had it working before the uh, webinar began. <laughs> well, let me uh, get back into that and see if I can fix that. There we go. There we go. Um, and then if you can turn on your camera. Oh, you do want to see me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. So as I mentioned, um, or as Chris mentioned, my name is Erin Rosiello, and I'm a passionate passenger rail advocate from Ohio. As former chair for the statewide passenger rail advocacy group, All Aboard Ohio, I just spent four months implementing a plan that we created to increase awareness in Ohio for passenger rail. I'm here to talk about advocacy 
And I really don't think that we can advocate without first understanding the framework of the Federal Rail Commission's corridor ID program and the opportunity that presents itself. It's our best chance to get the necessary dollars for planning that will allow our state legislators and decision makers to make informed decisions. Additionally, I'm gonna share information with you about a four month campaign that was designed to educate and increase awareness of the Corridor ID planning grant program and what that means to the states and how folks can get involved. The idea was to utilize the December announcement of the Corridor ID grants that were approved to springboard into a three month long campaign. We called it the Whistle Stop Tour and we visited cities along the corridors that were selected for Ohio to bring education and information to those cities, villages and counties. So first, let's start with the Corridor ID program. Okay, so previously, um, the Federal Railroad Administration had programs, but this is the first time that they really focused on the planning and preparation necessary for a state to kind of walk through what they need, what they have, and uh, to perform all the general service plans, environmental studies necessary to get to the point of being shovel ready. So they wanted to build the foundation for long-term rail program. They wanted to bring world-class passenger rail service to regions across the country, and then also make a safer, cleaner, more equitable rail system. So this whole program was a foundational framework for identifying and developing new inner city passenger rail services under the program. And I'm not going to read the whole this whole slide. You can kind of see for yourself. But this is kind of the idea behind the whole program uh, of the corridor ID. So this kind of gives you an idea of the developmental stages. You have systems planning, project planning, project development. These are the very basic developmental stages, which are all part of the Corridor ID program. Once you have this prepared and ready to go and have a good feel for what those corridors would look like, what the ridership would look like, uh, what the costs would be for our decision makers to make the decision if the state wants to move forward, that is what this whole corridor ID program is about. Then you roll into the implementation and I'm going to show you a more simplified, easier to understand version of this later in the presentation that Rick put together for everyone. One thing that I really like to point out about this program is the corridor ID is a primary mechanism for dropping off Northeast Corridor, inner city passenger rail corridor. So what I'm saying here is that we see a lot of money going to the NEC on the East Coast. This is the first time for everybody in between that they're offering these planning services. So this is a home for all types of inner city passenger rail corridors. Um, they are going to make it an ongoing process where they regularly solicit proposals for additional corridors. And, you know, they talk about they just want to give everybody the heads up and set proper expectations. Um, level of non-federal commitment may be modest in the beginning, but it will grow as the corridor, I, you know, as you advance through the corridor program. So another neat thing about participating in the corridor ID program is that um, you will be prioritized when it's time to come to construction in considerations of grants moving forward. So corridor ID selection and beyond. Last year about this time, um, everybody was applying for the corridors that they wanted to include in the corridor ID program. And um, 
there are multiple ways that you could apply. Some folks wanted improvements to existing service. Um, that might be increased frequencies. Um, that might be time reduction, which would include, you know, some research and working with the freight rail lines. Um, but these were improvements to existing service. Some folks applied for extensions to existing service. Um, in the case of Ohio, we have what is called the Cleveland to Toledo. We currently have a train that goes between those two cities, but they wanted to extend it back up to Detroit. So that would be an extension to existing service. And then you also have entirely new service. And in Ohio, that would be um, the 3C and D corridor. And when I say entirely new, it used to exist back until about the late 70s, um, but at this point in time, that would be considered entirely new service. So what does this mean for different types of corridors? If it's an existing service, the amount of effort would be low. You know, you're just looking at, you know, what is the cost to work with the freight lines to increase frequency? Um, to add another train to an existing uh, uh, corridor. So that would be a low level of effort. On the medium to high end of medium, uh, working on reducing time on a, on a given corridor, um, increasing frequencies, adding extensions. And then on the very high end, this is new service on an existing rail line or new service on a new rail line. So each of these different scenarios has different levels of effort. So in Ohio, um, this is to give you an example, we had three very different corridor types. The three C and D, as I mentioned before, which is Cleveland, Columbus, Dayton, and Cincinnati, that was state-sponsored, it existed in the past, um, and that was one that the state applied for. Uh, the Cleveland Toledo Detroit, that was an extension adding Detroit, and that again was state sponsored. This one, which they call the Midwest Connects, um, Chicago, Fort Wayne, Columbus to Pittsburgh, this one was sponsored by the city of Fort Wayne being the lead, and then in Ohio, an MPO, um, Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission. So this one is a little bit different in that. Um, going east to west across Ohio, they're gonna to have to really work on some of the tracks. And this one surprised us all, increased service for an existing long distance, uh, long distance corridor. It just skims through the southern part of the state through Cincinnati called the Daily Cardinal and uh, goes from New York to Chicago with a stop in Cincinnati. It's currently three days a week and it's been that way uh, due to COVID they're hoping to make that a daily service. Amtrak actually applied for that fourth corridor, which was a surprise to us all. Here is a map just to give you a visual that I borrowed from High Speed Rail. Thank you very much. Um, and it kind of gives you a feel for the corridors, um, the three C and D from Cincinnati, Dayton, Columbus, up to Cleveland, and then it also shows the Fort Wayne would hit through Lima, go down to Columbus, over to Coshocton, and eventually Pittsburgh. In Cleveland, you have the corridor that goes between Cleveland, Toledo, and then up to Detroit. As I mentioned, there it doesn't really show the um, Cardinal because that is a long distance corridor, which is typically not considered as part of the, the corridor ID program but it just skims across Cincinnati and it goes up to Chicago. So we're gonna talk about the corridor ID. It has three steps. There are three stages to the actual corridor ID grant program. We are currently in the first stage, which was 100% funded, but I wanna talk a little bit about the service development plan or the second stage, because that is very key and it will answer so many of the questions that our legislators and our governors and decision makers have had. So the first one, this is where we are today, scoping. 
there were $500,000 grants for each of the corridors with a zero state match. So this scoping is basically where they decide, you know, who's going to be responsible for what and how much will a service development plan cost for that corridor. Each of these steps is contingent upon, the match is contingent upon completion of that step. So in step one, we're going to find out what a service development plan will cost. That in step two, Ohio will have to pay 10% of that cost. Um, here they also do a statement of work. So they have a kickoff meeting and the FRA reviews the work undertaken to date. And then that is when they do their statement of work to include corridor specific scope, schedule, and budget for the service development planning. So that's one, that's where we are today. I have heard all over the place, anywhere from 12 months to 18 months to complete this because the corridor ID is a first time program, that is not for sure. Step two, this is where I'd like to focus today. This is where a lot of the information that we want and need will come during the development, the service development plan. So um, this includes a capital project inventory, you know, what they will need. Um, it talks about a phased implementation plan, and it really drills down into the information that we want and need for our legislators to make informed decisions. That number that comes up after they they do their research and their sort of development plan is used to calculate the 20% match for stage three, the preliminary engineering and NEPA. So they start off with the preliminary engineering for capital projects. Uh, the sponsor will complete environmental review in coordination with the FRA. And the capital projects that complete step three will move to project pipeline and will probably be prioritized for funding necessary to go to construction. So why is the service development plan so important? Well, for starters, it's statutorily required, but it creates a whole planning framework and it sets the stage for the, the third stage of development. It includes relationship building. We have to work with the freight rail lines and determine who is going to do what, um, improve project delivery timeframes, and on the ground outcome and benefits. It demonstrates feasibility. Um, it's going to have the sponsor strategic plan for improving, expanding, or initiating a corridor. And it will identify an operating plan, a capital plan, and an investment case. And it's an organizational tool. So it's just super important in this next slide, we'll kind of illustrate what all goes into that. We're not gonna go through the whole thing, but I just wanted to give you a visual of what that would include. So they have all these tasks, right, that are involved. But what is wonderful is they have stakeholder engagement plans. They have public engagement, data collection, ridership and revenue forecasting, all those things that, you know, our, our legislators want to know. They always say, well, how many people are going to ride it? And how many times a day will it run? And where will all the stations be? This is where those important questions are uh, figured out. Capital cost estimation, financial planning, benefit cost analysis. So this is super important. And um, I will share with you all, and I'll get into it more on the advocacy part, but this is a three-stage process. Part of our advocacy is to let our state decision makers, our legislators know we want them to complete all three stages so that they can make truly informed decisions. As I mentioned before, uh, Rick was kind enough to put together an easy to understand uh, perspective, non-FRI <laughs> perspective of the process. So, you know, ideally you have state and regional plans, Let's say you belong to um, uh, MIPRC is one that comes to mind. It's the Midway, Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission. It is a group that has uh, compacts between the state that allow them to work together and everybody abides by the same rules. 
That's something that states can do up front in advance. Then you get into the stage one, we just discussed the scoping, the service development plan, preliminary engineering and NEPA. And this is all, these three steps are part of the corridor ID program. Once you get to being shovel ready, your state should be prioritized because they did complete this process for grants to find your final design construction and then into operation. Just this one, I want to keep it simple, stupid. It's basically if you have more than one corridor that like Ohio has four, um, they prioritize them based on any preliminary work that may have been done. And the point is the FRA says they will meet you where you are in the stage of project, uh, project development in that life cycle. Another thing I wanted to share, and this is kind of important when you are crossing over state lines, like Midwest Connects, uh, which is the Fort Wayne that crosses into Ohio, and then Morpsey, the MPO that sponsored it in Ohio, is you go through a process of defining roles and responsibilities with regard to the geographic overlap. And this is something taken into consideration when you have shared segments, shared stations and terminals, and even shared markets. Um, it is my understanding they will share this uh, presentation with you, and we have links for you if you want to learn more about the FRA. They have webinars that have been recorded. Um, it talks in more detail about the grant program and then program support email. And what I will share, guys, is that this isn't a one-shot deal. This is an ongoing program. We just had the first slew ever of applications and grants that have been given out, but this will be ongoing. You know, many cities in the state of Ohio were like, well, why isn't this city involved? And why isn't that city involved? There's plenty of time. We just need to start off with a couple of great corridors in the state to get the program up and rolling. Okay, so we talked about the FRA's corridor ID program. Really important to understand because guys, this is gonna be the next four to five years of our advocacy is getting through the corridor ID program. Estimates are about five years to complete stages one through three in the corridor ID, which is purely planning and preparation to be shovel ready. So how do we advocate? Let's talk about how do we advocate? So in the state of Ohio, we knew these announcements were coming out and we thought, okay, how do we uh, utilize these announcements to increase awareness in Ohio uh, for our passenger rail program? So. We had a passenger rail advocacy strategy. Um, it was so good, we did it twice. Uh, we had a kickoff in December with the FRA's announcement talking about our whistle stop tours, which is basically, I'll go into more detail, but basically taking information to the public and then we'll talk about the results. So, Framing this, going out to the public and talking about why do we need passenger rail? I think everybody has their own reasons of why, but there is one theory that has been around since the 1960s, and our Department of Transportation are well aware of it. Um, this has been around for a long time. Every time you add a lane to a highway, eventually that lane two will be used and you're back to congestion. The picture I'm showing you here is what is called the Katy Freeway and it is in Houston, Texas. And while in Ohio, we're nowhere near this, I think it's a good cautionary tale. Um, in 2008, they spent over $3 billion expanding it further and it is back to congestion. Um, I also share the story of, of Virginia, okay, the state of Virginia. 
the uh, Secretary of Transportation, when she came on board, was tasked with reducing congestion on I-95. She reached out to her Department of Transportation and said, okay, let's look at the numbers. Let's add one lane each way on I-95 for 50 miles. And um, they ran the numbers and they came back with a $12 billion price tag, which is jaw dropping. And she asked the question, does this fix the problem? Will this fix the congestion problem? And they said, unfortunately, by the time they completed the 50 mile additional lane in each direction, it would take 10 years that it would be back to congestion. Again, that is the induced demand. So at that point in time, the state uh, decided that they really needed to have other options, transportation options. And I'll tell you in Ohio, we have zero. It is cars, it is auto-centric, and we don't have any way within our state to get from Cincinnati to Cleveland or Dayton to Cleveland or even to Columbus other than driving your car or an Uber, which can be rather pricey if you've tried it. So I share this story in that while none of us are quite to Kitty Freeway, this is induced demand. And if we continue to just add highways and more highways and freeways and overpasses, um, that is not going to fix the problem. So this is kind of the way we would start our conversation. I would also ask everybody in the room, um, have you ever been stuck in traffic in Ohio? Every single time we had an event, everybody's hand went up. Okay, so this is just one passenger rail advocacy strategy, but this is the one that we came up with last year. We utilized the FRA announcement to kick off a whistle stop tour. That announcement was made in early December. We didn't send out press releases. Press releases are boring. People send them out all the time and rarely do they get any attention. I know when I first came on board with Ohio's uh, advocacy group over three years ago, we might get an article in one random newspaper on one television station once every quarter or maybe every six months. We decided we needed to be more aggressive and do something different. So we sent out a media advisory two days before we had a press conference via Zoom to kick off the FRA announcement and to announce our whistle stop tour. We had over 15 different media outlets attend the press conference and we had over 25 articles and interviews from that event throughout December. And, uh, we used it as an opportunity to also announce our upcoming whistle stop tours, dates and locations. So basically the whistle stop tours were six major cities along the corridors that were selected and two rural cities um, that were also along the corridors, as well as we held a whistle stop tour at the state house for both senators and state representatives. This is just to give you an idea. I mean, if I Google back in December, uh, the media coverage from our whistle stop tour, this is just a, a really small sampling of what came up. This wasn't just, you know, our morning journals and things like that. Um, this ended up being in Axios and we hit quite a bit of national news just from having a Zoom event. So not just the 15 uh, media sources that attended our Zoom event, once you run an article, it kind of snowballs. You can also use the echo chamber of your social media to give them more clicks, which makes them want to cover it even more. So it was a, a very healthy turnout for just the basic announcement of the FRA uh, corridor ID corridors in Ohio, and then talking about our whistle stop tour. So we selected six cities along two major corridors in conjunction with the metropolitan planning organizations. MPOs are very important. Some of them are small and might be one county. Some of them, like our Central Ohio MPO, has 14 counties. Um, they were very willing to work with us and offered us conference rooms or rooms that we could have our events in. 
Uh, one MPO even rented a library conference room with a, uh, for us, and they provided refreshments and also cross-promoted it for us. One of the best parts about working with your MPOs is guess who is who's on their boards. The MPOs boards are typically made up of municipal leadership. So what you're doing is you're inviting the decision makers that will be involved in things like, you know, where should the station be? What can we build there? Uh, can we contribute some money? Um, so it was very important. That was exactly the audience that we needed to speak to. And we didn't just send out, like I said, we didn't just have our little press release. We had our conference and invited the media to attend. We didn't ask them to come cover it. We said, hey, just come check it out, learn something. So we added two rural stops, Village of Crestline, guys, this is amazing. A village of less than 400 people, or I'm sorry, less than 5,000 people had 400 people in attendance at our whistle stop tour. It was incredible. And then we also had one in Lima, Ohio. Rural stops are important because many of our legislators come from rural areas and they feel like because the stops aren't hitting every single little village or city that it's not beneficial. No, these cities want it. Even if they're 15 minutes, 25 minutes from a station, they want access to transportation options that can get them across the state. We also presented to the General Assembly um, do not be sad or upset if only aides attend. We had a lot of aides attend. I will share a little secret with you. The General Assembly's aides often know more information, have more data, and are more knowledgeable about many things that are um, in front of our legislators. So that was very beneficial, and uh, we got the opportunity to educate them and bring them up to speed. As I said, we invited the media and we didn't send out press releases. We sent invitations. After the fact, we sent out press releases. And for those media that couldn't make it, we often got a little additional bump in coverage. We um, promoted the whole series of uh, whistle stop tours via these interviews, our social media, website, and emails. We had anywhere, it depended upon the room size, but we had anywhere from 30 to 400 attendees per event. And the results were just amazing. Increased awareness via media coverage and so social media reposts, kind of a little echo chamber, so to speak. We put together basically agendas. You work with your MPO. Oftentimes they're happy to send out the invitations to their board members, which makes it more legit. You get more of them attending. You involve them, allow them to speak in the beginning. Sometimes they would invite their own state representatives and mayors that they had relationships with. Um, introduction to the presentation, I, as I mentioned before, talk to them about um, induced demand. And one thing I find interesting is so, so many people have been uh, kind of scared that, oh no, we have to work with the freight rail lines and they don't wanna work with us. We're not reinventing the wheel here. State of North Carolina is very similar to Ohio, similar in population, similar in that they have big cities with population and a lot of rural in between. They are working with the freight rail line successfully. They have partnerships. It can be done. And I would share with them the passenger rail success story of Virginia. Um, talk about the goals of the day and the overview. So this just gives you kind of an idea. We did also have in Ohio an economic impact study. We had received a grant from the Columbus Foundation. It was only enough money to perform the study on uh, one corridor, but that was a nice little ad that we could share that kind of localized it and, and gave them an idea that it's not just all about costs, it also can bring money to the state. So January through April, April, nine whistle stops for increased awareness. As I said, we coordinated with MPOs in the state house. Um, they gave us rooms, they gave us IT, they cross-promoted it and sent invitation to board members. Um, they had registration set up on the 
All Aboard Ohio advocacy website and had to monitor it based on room capacity. The primary invitees were the board members. And as I said, municipalities, you might want to invite your chambers of commerce and definitely invite the media. It was only an hour long. Uh, talked about the induced demand, FRA update, economic impact, and had Q&A. This was a great opportunity to get printed material in the hands of 600 plus uh, people that showed up. They registered, they showed up, and they were engaged. We have a sheet that we use of frequently asked questions, benefits of passenger rail, and a one-page summary of our study. One thing I'd like to highlight about the benefits, um, you will find that many of us are passionate about the underserved communities, the 20% that don't have cars, the more than 20% in Ohio that don't have their license and can't afford to get it back. Ohio has very harsh laws that cause many people not to have a driver's license. While those things are important, when speaking to our supermajority Republican legislature, they want to hear about the economic impact. They want to hear about uh, companies that they're recruiting to come to the state of Ohio want employee mobility. They want transportation choices. So just for Ohio to be competitive and to bring in, you know, smart young people that are qualified for jobs, we need to make it attractive and we need to have uh, transportation alternatives. So you have two different audiences you're kind of speaking to. You know, you've got the folks that want to take care of people, but you also have to understand the language that you use with your legislators has to be a little bit more business oriented. At the end of the day, if you get passenger rail, we're still helping the underserved communities. Okay, so let's talk results. Um, over 600 registered and attended the in-person events. All received printed materials, as I mentioned before, and I had them register and give us their emails, which beefs up your email list. Um, we had question and answer opportunities to get everybody engaged. And with the second round, we had over 40 articles. I don't even know anymore. I used to have a, a Google thing that let me know anytime an article was out with all aboard Ohio's name. But over, I found over 40 interviews, radio, television, internet, and print. Um, another thing, a, a little you know, lesson learned is I would assist any media that reached out to me I would send them one page summaries. I would send them frequently asked questions. I would send them a summary of the um, FRA's corridor ID process. They appreciate that. And then they have good facts to include in their articles. Then we would repost articles on our website and social media. Again, that kind of echo chamber um, effect. This is just a smattering, a very little list of all of the different articles. And I mean, you can see them for yourself when you get a copy of this presentation, click on them. The messaging may vary kind of based on the interview, but at the end of the day, this is all increased awareness that previously nobody was talking about in the media in Ohio. So that is basically what I had to share today, and I would love to hear your questions. And if you could stop sharing the screen. Excellent. So uh, this is very exciting. Uh, I, uh, I remember the slog of, of going to, uh, back when I was younger and able to do this more often, going to Rotary Clubs and doing events like this on a regular basis. But uh, clearly the foundation of making something work, what should happen next um, for these people in, in, in you know, Ohio for advocacy? Well, I think that um, with something like this, we kicked it off, we, we had a lot of success. You gotta keep the momentum going. And this is the long haul guys. We've got four or five years that we need to keep people engaged. And, and folks need to be told what to do next. With this first grant, we are not sitting around and waiting 
for a year to 18 months before our next advocacy action. We should be, still be educating and letting folks know right now they can reach out to their legislators and decision makers and municipalities and say, I want our state to finish all three stages of this grant process. And I'll let you know something, they have an off ramp after stage one. They have an off ramp after stage two. There is no guarantee your state will go all the way through the process. So you need to let the legislators know that you kind of, I mean, nicely let them know that they can't make a good decision unless they complete the entire corridor ID program process. They won't have all the information that they need. So that's one thing. Another thing that I've talked to Rick about and, and I agree with wholeheartedly is that you can ask the sponsors. So in your state, in Ohio, that's the Ohio Rail Commission, right? Or it might be your DOT. You can ask the sponsors to look at some other options. Say, hey, look, I know we're, we're talking about upgrading freight rail to accommodate passenger rail at 79 miles an hour. Is there any way we could also look at the difference in cost to just go for it and go straight to high-speed rail. So that is, I mean, that's a conversation that you can have and you can also have your, uh, your advocates and your followers reach out to their representatives and, and have those conversations. So I think that, you know, we don't have to just lock ourselves into, okay, we're upgrading uh, the freight rail lines to 79 miles an hour, three times a day in Ohio, what if it's five times a day? Do they have the ability to ask during this process and during this research to look at more frequency and the cost of that? So, you know, I've heard a lot of legislators say, yeah, we want passenger rail, but we want fast passenger rail. Okay, well, let's look at fast passenger rail and get a price for both. Let's look at the difference of cost. So it's not over. If anything else, right now is the time for the next 12 to 18 months to be talking to the decision makers or whoever is the, uh, the person that's sponsored for your state and say, what about these things? Can we look at the price of going straight to high speed? Is that even possible? Can we get that done? And then also letting your legislators know, hey, guys, doing the first one that's 100% federally funded is not going to get the job done. We expect due diligence and would like to see this entire program completed. Excellent. And then how do we keep those folks that, that are engaged now a little bit in the congressional, you know, because every year Congress decides how much money to spend on rail programs. Unfortunately, a critical program took a bit of a haircut this last go round. So how do we keep these folks engaged every year in, in pushing for a, a bigger appropriation? Well, the, the thought is this, A, you wanna, you wanna grow your membership. And, and, and I know that in Ohio, we have barely skimmed the surface. Just to give you an idea, All Aboard Ohio has been around 50 years and has like 200 paid members maybe eight or 10,000 people that they uh, communicate with via social media, there are 11.8 million people in Ohio. So these events are important to increase awareness, increase your membership and increase the voice that reaches out to our Congress people, that reaches out to our state representatives and uh, senators. Um, on the legislative end, yes, I would stay in touch personally I reach out to Sherrod Brown, Greg Landsman, they know me by name, J.D. Vance, and let them know that we want passenger rail. Please support passenger rail. Do not cut passenger rail. So that's at your Congress level. But the state level, they need education. They need you to come in and tell them what's going on and how it will benefit the state and how it will make them look like a rock star being able to bring companies into the state and talent into the state because you have transportation options. You know, I gotta tell you, I am uh, starting tomorrow. I am going to Denison, which is outside of Cleveland, Case Western, Cleveland. Um, now Denison is down closer to Columbus, Oberlin. Um, 
Oxford, Miami and Oxford, and then Purdue and, and uh, Indiana University. And I don't want to make that drive. And I think it's reasonable for us to think that college students going to those places shouldn't have to drive either. But uh, if you look at the maps we have, I could actually, if we actually had a, just a small reasonable train system, we could do that. So I'm, I'm very focused on Ohio and I appreciate you bringing the, the topic up. Uh, uh, Chris, are there any, uh, any other questions? Yes, there are. And uh, let's start though with, uh, with praise. Uh, Aaron, you know, beforehand, I, I think I mentioned that I thought that people in other states would be really interested in the work that you've done in Ohio. And here's a demonstration of that. Uh, praise from Martin in the audience who says, your awareness campaign seems like a nice blueprint for educating folks in South Carolina, which requested no corridor ID grants. So uh, there you go. And we've had some other uh, you know, questions, which I think you responded to already uh, from people you know, looking for advice about how to apply it. Um, uh, but moving along, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Frederick asks or says, uh, connecting our major cities is a great first step, but it feels like in some ways we're going in reverse. Some cities have large rapid transit and commuter rail networks. Is there a movement to get intra-city rail and inter-city rail for these trips to and from the city center? Uh, with Intel and others moving into the suburbs of Columbus, for example, how can we get the powers that be to consider commuter rail options and not just the usual highway expansions? So, so that would be conversations to have, I believe, with your legislators again. And um, within Columbus, there are actually groups that, that are looking at other options. Um, they look at alternatives to transportation. Uh, maybe start with MORPC. Um, that is the MPO in Central Ohio based out of Columbus. And MORPC is a sponsor for, as I mentioned before, the Midwest Connects or the Fort Wayne to Pittsburgh line. Um, it, it's kind of the chicken or the egg thing. You know, we talk about we we need in, interstate, you know, within our states, but you also within the cities need other transportation modes. I do believe that if you have passenger rail coming to Columbus, they've talked about a multimodal station which then would bring in other modes of transportation within the city. Like when you go to the airport, you might have the option of taking a train in Chicago or a bus or you know, inner city. I think that when we bring to these cities the opportunity to have access to that city, they're gonna have to address and construct and build these things out. One part that I didn't share, guys, is that in Ohio, we pulled together a coalition of municipalities that meets once a quarter in Columbus at Morpsey. And this came out of me meeting with city council members, chambers of commerce, mayors, uh, county commissioners all over, got them all meeting. Uh, there's over 50 that participate. And that is an opportunity to talk to them about what are you doing in your city to prepare for passenger rail to come? Where is your station gonna be? What other modes of transportation will tie in at that station? How are you gonna get people from the station to where they need to go? Um, so there are more than one ways to skin that cat, but what I would say is this, at least in Ohio, we need one big corridor to get up and running. And I think others will follow, extensions will follow. Some of the cities that maybe didn't make it the first round for stops may get consideration, but you gotta start somewhere and you can't please everybody. We've gotta start somewhere. With regard to the inner city, that is gonna be up to the city and that's gonna be up to the county and that's gonna be up to the MPOs. So we need to involve them. Thank you. And, uh, you know, given what you said uh, about getting one, at least one up and running, uh, this that's a good lead into this next question. Uh, it's sort of asking you to pick a favorite. Uh, Fred asks, in your opinion, which of the four corridor projects is the most important to Ohio? Oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> it, it's so funny, too, traveling all over the state, each state, each 
corner of the state has their favorite. But I think to have the biggest impact, it would be the three C and D, because that is tying together Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, and Dayton, our largest cities, and it, it can take you all over the state. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a few more questions and a few more minutes, and uh, I saw someone raise a hand. If uh, if you have a question, please put it in the Q and A, uh, and then we'll we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we have a couple of questions about the class one freight railroads. Uh, Roger in Chicago asks, uh, can you can you identify the class one railroads in the Ohio corridors and their degree of positive response? And then closely related to that, I guess an audience member who's logged in as just build it uh, asks if you have advice on getting the support or, or getting support or cooperation from the, those class one railroads to use the existing rights of way. So they're the two largest are CSX and Norfolk Southern. And the interesting point is that they're already working with passenger rail in North Carolina and Virginia. Heck, even in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania just got another train added, a whole new line added to one of their corridors by working with the freight rail lines, it was a $200 million deal. Um, it, you know, it's kind of a negotiation. What can we as advocates do? Um, I had not quite moved into that realm with the exception of had recruited an executive director who works for CSX and is a lobbyist for CSX on our board. He is also a passenger rail advocate. So there are many different ways that you can do that. Um, I would start out by working with the sponsors, the entities that have sponsored the corridors and talking to them and asking them about their relationship and what, what they intend to do to cultivate those relationships. Great, thank you. Uh, Michael Podgers, a co-chair of our volunteer group, the Ambassadors Committee, says, I imagine this work required significant time and material resources. How did All Aboard Ohio fundraise and prepare resources in advance of the advocacy of these advocacy, advocacy efforts? And how did the Whistle Stop Tour and related efforts uh, impact fundraising? Did it help increase donation levels and engage potential supporters? So originally, the idea was to get sponsors involved to to help offset the cost but it just all came so fast and furious with the announcement um we did not have time to get the sponsors i will tell you you can do it pretty affordably the printed materials maybe six hundred dollars um i had all the sponsorship rooms and everything else paid for it was a full-time job i mean Basically, as the chairperson for All Aboard Ohio, I do not have another job. I was able to travel the state and do this. Um, it, it takes an investment of time. It really does. With regard to money, other like I said, other than the printed materials, it's it's just rolling up your sleeves and hard work. Okay, thanks. Martin asks, has Ohio shown interest in a route from the Midwest to the Carolinas in the FRA's long distance study? Uh, he says that they pushed for it in the Carolinas but weren't included. Are there any, any interested parties in your region? Um, not so sure about the long distance as our advocacy group has focused on getting rail within the state. And typically, the advocacy groups like with the uh, Cardinal didn't have a whole lot of say in Amtrak improving the service there. But that being said, they are looking at two north to south long distance corridors. I've heard this recently. I don't know a lot of the detail about it, but personally would love to see it uh, connect with the with the Carolinas. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you, but um, long distance I'm not as familiar as I am with within the state. Okay. And Aaron, you mentioned uh, send for the media side of this, you mentioned sending invitations to reporters and then doing a public news release afterward. Was that to be able to select reporters that had a history of doing good coverage or, or for some other reason? Um, it was to get them there. I will share with you that um, in Cincinnati, 
which had our smallest turnout, maybe at 35 or 40 people, we had three television stations show up for our event and interviews with all three television stations. So um, I don't know that they're used to being invited. They're used to seeing cookie cutter press releases that are too long and they lose interest and, and they might send like their intern to go cover them. But you're reaching out to reporters and inviting them saying, hey, come check this out. We want you to be a part of this. A little bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay, good advice. Thanks. And then uh, last question. Uh, could you share your contact information again? Sure, it's it's pretty easy. And maybe if you send out the presentation, you could share it with them. It's Aaron Rosiello. It's just my name at gmail.com. Okay. And uh, it's E R I N. R O S I E L L O all together, Aaron Rosiello at gmail.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions, share any ideas, because I am so passionate about this, guys. I want to see it everywhere. I want to see passenger rail everywhere, and I want to see high speed everywhere. That would be nice. <laughs> well, we agree. And why don't we turn things back to Rick now? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Aaron, thank you so much. This was very helpful. Um, and again, I will spend a number of days in Ohio next week and I wish I could take the train between those places. Um, for those who joined us today, I hope this was helpful. If it was, if you'd like to see more of these, please join us. And you can get a hat to share the idea with your friends and let's get more people engaged. So again, Aaron, thank you. And thank you to our audience. And we will meet again soon. Thank you, everyone.